Well, we will start now, and uh, thank you for joining um, the uh, series uh, that is organized by the uh, ESIAC, which is International Society for Indoor Air Quality and Climate on COVID-19. Again, my name is Paweł Wargocki, and I am the uh, president of uh, the Academy of Fellows, and I'm normally uh, working at the Technical University mm. of Denmark as the associate professor. As you know, uh, ESIAC uh, has been running uh, or ran the uh, webinar series on COVID in 2020, and then uh, we decided to um, continue the success uh, in 2021. And uh, this is the third uh, webinar uh, on that topic, and more will be coming. So please uh, uh, visit our web page um, um, and see for the new and coming uh, webinars. Uh, they are basically every uh, in, with a month's difference. Um, so today we have um, two um, speakers, um, and uh, there, there are excellent speakers. Both are coming from UK. And the first speaker will be uh, Professor Julian Tang, and the other speaker will be Kat Noakes. And as I said, I will be moderating this session together with uh, Professor Hugo Lee, uh, who is the um, editor of Indoor Art Journal. Actually, he will be uh, sharing this. Uh, I'll be just making the introductory comments. Can I have a next slide, please? Well, before we start, I think we should all cheer up to uh, Kath Noakes is one of our speakers, who last year uh, uh, was announced to, to receive an award. And he, two days ago, received actually an award from the uh, um, Duke of, of Cambridge. Uh, and that award is the uh, Officer of the Order of the British Empire, OBE for her services to COVID-19 response. So congratulations, uh, Kath. This is uh, an incredible honor for you and generally for all your work that you have been doing uh, during the um, COVID-19 pandemic. Th congratulations, Kath. So can we go to the next slide? Yeah, so um, this series is organized by the International Society for Indoor Air Quality and Climate. The president of the society, Dr. Corinne Mandel, uh, and the president-elect, uh, uh, Professor Ying Su, uh, could not join us today, so I'll make the uh, introduction uh, on their behalf. And they, of course, apologize for not being uh, able to join. So ESIAC is an international, independent, multidisciplinary, scientific, nonprofit organization. And our purpose is to support the creation of healthy, comfortable, and productive indoor environment. ESIAC was established in 1992, and it, now uh, there are 651 members who are, uh, uh, who are the part of the society. Well, society, um, as a member of the society, you have an access to indoor air journal and to the newsletter. And then you can participate also in other activities of uh, the society. Those activities are the uh, scientific and technical committees. And um, there is plenty of resources on the website. Um, uh, these different resources are uh, the previous publications, reports, and conference proceedings. ESIAC also organizes two uh, major conferences. Uh, every second year, we organize our flagship conference in Dorer. And the next year, we'll, uh, this flagship conference will be uh, organized uh, in uh, Finland, in Kuopio, in uh, uh, June. And then we, um, in the years between the indoor air conferences, we organize a regional healthy building conferences and the incoming regional healthy building is also next year because it is delayed because, because of the pandemic and it will be organized in Honolulu and that's the healthy buildings US. And then the following 2023, there will be another uh, conference. We also provide uh, awards to students and summer school for students in relation with indoor uh, conference and then also mentorship program. Can I have a next slide? And then um, 
The webinar is organized with the Academy of Fellows and the Academy of Fellows um, is a, a part of the ESIAC and previously it was an Academy of Indoor Air Sciences, but we merged with ESIAC in, I believe, 2005, if I, don't, if I remember well. And it was founded before the um, ESIAC and uh, basically founded to, um, to find or to organize the um, indoor air, uh, conferences in the beginning, which were organized every three years. And uh, you are nominated to Academy of Fellows and fellows are recognized for research practice and outstanding service in indoor air sciences. We have over 130 fellows from 20 countries. And our role be besides of the uh, participating in the activities of ESIAC is to nominate and select additional fellows, promote and select major award recipients, and advance the field of indoor sciences, among others, contribute to this type of webinars and help to educate practitioners to the public. I am the president of the academy, and the president elect is Professor Yingping Zhang from Tsinghua, and our secretary uh, is. Uh, Professor Shelley Miller. Can we proceed to the next slide? So now uh, for the uh, housekeeping announcements. Uh, so um, this is about the webinar format. Before we start, uh, I'll be finishing soon. So during the presentation, everyone should stay muted. You should type your questions to the chat screen and the questions will be answered after the both presentations. So we will be running both presentations and towards the end, we will start the question and answer session. The session may go over the one hour that is scheduled. And uh, uh, so if you want to stay longer, please do. And of course, if our speakers can stay longer, stay, they stay longer, they will also stay. Some of the content may be unpublished that is in the presentation. So please do not distribute the um, presentations. The webinar is recorded and will be made available through ESIAC member portal meaning you can participate at this live without being a member of ECR, but if you want to go back and see it, or if your colleagues want to see this webinar afterwards, they need to become an ECR member to be able to see it. So at this moment, the record will start. Our recording is already on, so, okay, um, before, <laughs> okay, the next slide. I forgot about this. So I already mentioned that our upcoming events that are organized by the, um, by our society is Healthy Buildings America 2021 in Honolulu in January, and then Indoor Air in June in Kuopio, Finland. And as I said, this series of webinar will continue and uh, stay tuned on our website uh, to learn about the next uh, event that will be coming either in January or early February. So now we will uh, start the actual webinar. So I invite Professor Hugo Lee to make introductions of our speakers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Parwell uh, Wakaski, and ladies and gentlemen, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And uh, indeed, a great pleasure to serve as a moderator for this special webinar together with Professor uh, Pavel Wakaski particularly with two uh, distinguished scientists in the field of transmission of SARS-CoV-2 and intervention, which is a topic also close to my heart. So uh, we will have a Q&A session after the two talks. So please uh, send your comments and, and questions via uh, to me, Yugo Li, Yugo Li, um, uh, in the chat box. Uh, and that will allow me to read out your question directly. So, uh, pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, my friend, my long time collaborator, uh, Dr. Julian Tang, uh, who is a consultant virologist, uh, honor associate professor at Clinic, Clinical Microbiology, University of Lancaster, NHS Trust, and also at Respiratory Sciences at the University of Lan uh, uh, Lancaster. So Julian is a fellow of Rural College of uh, Pathologists and a fellow of the Hong Kong College of uh, Pathologists and a fellow of Hong Kong Academy of Medicine. So he was trained in medicine and geology at Cambridge before completing a geology PhD in biological fluid dynamics at uh, uh, Aberdeen. So then he finished medical training, training in Sheffield 
And, and, and uh, after general medical training, he completed his specialist clinical virology training at the University College London in 2005. And then followed his very successful academic and research career in Hong Kong, Singapore, Edmonton, Canada, and now in Lancaster. So he actually work covers basically uh, interest in respiratory viruses, particularly on influenza and uh, uh, SARS and SARS-CoV-2. Over the years, I have learned a lot from uh, Julian. I also look forward uh, to learn more from you, from you, Julian. Let's welcome Julian. Hello, <clears throat> thanks Hugo for your kind introduction. Uh, we've been friends for about uh, almost 20 years now since the first SARS-CoV outbreak in 2003. And Yugo's asked me a lot, many times, including colleagues in ISIAC, uh, to try and join them as part of their academic panel or fellow to lend this medical uh, input into their work. And uh, now with COVID, we can see the engineers working very closely uh, with infection control people uh, in the clinical sciences. Uh, and that's not, that hasn't come without some, um, how can I say, friction. Um, there have been several comments in the media saying, uh, particularly from some of the infection control people in the UK, saying that engineers uh, don't know what they're talking about and uh, they should stay up at infection control, etc., uh, which I think is a bit unkind. So what I'm trying to do here is to um, give you some insight into how uh, clinicians think about evidence and about how they process evidence uh, to support or not support aerosol transmission. And there has been a historical paper um, published or being revised now about how the ideas between droplets and aerosols have come about in the infection control world. And a lot of those concepts are actually not based on physics, uh, based on a very historical uh, accounts and expert opinion. And they've actually diverged from the physics in, in quite significant ways. <clears throat> so I'll give you an example of this. Um, so for example, um, the infection control people believe that droplets can be inhaled but over a short distance. They can travel over a short distance, still be inhaled, and that's what they call droplet spread, um, without realizing that, in fact, that is also an aerosol. If you can inhale it and it's airborne, you can inhale it, it's also an aerosol. But to them, the aerosol means that uh, it transmits very far away. It doesn't transmit when you're close, because the terms are used in different ways from how a physicist or engineer might use them. And this terminology has really been a barrier to how people and these two different groups understand each other, that even going to the level of WHO, for example. And a lot of us are now involved with WHO trying to explain this, this difference, which is actually not a difference, and how to try and merge these terminologies to try and bring together these very different groups of people with different backgrounds to try to reach a common goal, as in how to prevent uh, airborne transmission and spread of these different viruses. So what I'm going to do today is just go through some of the basic respiratory virus um, uh, biology and try to cover, if you like, some of the gaps in the engineering side about how these viruses behave and transmit in, in the human population. So if you look on the slide here, um, in the main picture, you have the respiratory tract. You're probably familiar with this now. Uh, and the list of different viruses that can be transmitted from the respiratory tract uh, into uh, other people by, by inhalation, by touch and thermite in self-inoculation at short range and also long range. The problem with this is that, uh, as numerous articles have actually been uh, uh, stating um, over the past 18 months, uh, most, mostly led by Lydia Borowska, is that we don't really know uh, how much and how far these viruses transmit in a typical everyday situation. Uh, in the hospital situation, we can be a bit more certain. There have been many more studies based on the wards uh, with these different viruses, and the, there are papers um, basically uh, indicating airborne transmission over longer distances uh, with different respiratory viruses. And I'll go through some of them today, and that includes rhinoviruses, coronaviruses, influenza viruses, RSV, and adenoviruses, and even Coxsackie virus there at the top right, at the bottom of the list. Now, some of these viruses can penetrate into the lower respiratory tract and cause more severe disease. Next slide, please. So again, most of you will now be familiar with this after COVID uh, has been raging for the last 18 months. How do we in the clinical field detect when the, when the virus is there? So we take a swab, we run it on the PCR machine, uh, and then we get a positive result if it's there and a negative result if it's not. Uh, 
And PCR is very sensitive, so it tends to pick up a true positive when it's there, but it's also very specific because of the primers and probe design, so that if it's not there, it shouldn't pick it up. And of course, that's a problem with that because there's cross-contamination in the lab, but assuming that that's kept to a minimum, and what you can see that is that we can quantify the viruses in the swab, uh, and you can see that for acute infection, the first few days of infection after onset of symptoms, uh, the viral list may be as high as 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 copies uh, of RNA per mill of collection fluid. Okay, uh, and this is really basically what's on the swab. So if you swab for a long time, get lots of virus on there, you get more virus. If you swab very quickly, you might get less virus. But in the acute phase, you have lots of virus there, like 100 million viruses in that oral pharyngeal area. It's very hard to miss it. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is where some of the physiology and physics comes in. <clears throat> and if you can imagine, your mouth is a very dirty area. If you have uh, oropharyngeal uh, viral loads uh, in the mucosa saliva uh, fluid there, there's other things there. There's immune response uh, proteins, there are immune response cells there, the so-called salivary mucins, which are long chain polysaccharides uh, that can actually capture and hold and neutralize some viruses and bacteria. And these have been around for, you know, since man has evolved uh, to be a, a first line of defense, if you like. And this is what we call the innate and non-specific immune response. And that response has lots of impact on the viscosity and the nature of the fluids in your oral pharynx. So it's not just like a kind of water or saline nebulizer that you can actually just aerosolize and, and expel. And those salivary mucins and mucus saliva, and the different viscosities can affect how much virus is actually exhaled. And on the left there, you see the kind of standard IPC infection control and prevention uh, paradigm. So you've got uh, air ball, which is typically long range, as they say, droplets, which is short range, and contaminated surfaces, which is direct contact. And what we're trying to do in the kind of the COVID era is to combine the top two droplets and droplet nuclei into so-called aerosols. And if they're a droplet, they fall to the ground under gravity almost immediately. They're greater than 100 microns in diameter. And we do not worry about those anymore in aerosol transmission. Below that diameter, they can still be transmitted of short range, uh, which is one of Yugo Lee's specialties at the moment, over conversational distances. You can see from my, my little Schlerin post photo on the top, and also over longer range, where you then enter the kind of wells riley assumption, where you have uniform distribution of quanta, or airborne virus, virus loads, uh, across the whole volume of the room. And wells riley assumes uniform distribution from time zero. That's not really, 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 really realistic, but when you have a long, exposure in a large area with uh, multiple occupants, you might reach that kind of uh, equilibrium. And the issue here is how do we convince the infection control and clinical people that aerosol transmission is important, it occurs, and how can we mitigate that through ventilation uh, and reduce occupancy uh, or other things like CO2 monitoring and then on-demand ventilation, et cetera. Next slide, please. So, I've broken the kind of evidence down that clinical people look at into three different categories to help you understand how we think about this. And the first one is really um, a physiological physics argument, which I tend to use with my clinical colleagues, that if you have a mouthful of virus and you're talking, breathing, coughing, sneezing, et cetera, some of the virus will be aerosolized and be pushed out when you exhale. Okay, so how can we show that actually happens? And there have been some very innovative experiments and, and studies done uh, during COVID that I'm going to go through quickly now. Next slide, please. So some of you may know Don Milton. Uh, Don Milton is a, uh, is a actually, it's a public health physician uh, in the University of Maryland. And Don's been around for a long time looking at aerosol transmission of different viruses, including rhinoviruses, influenza, and now COVID. And what he's come up with is this so-called Gesundheit 2 machine, which is based on a design from uh, some earlier investigators. But basically, you stick your head in this cone and you talk, you breathe, you cough, you sneeze uh, over a duration, typically 30 minutes. And this cone captures everything that you exhale. OK, so in a way, it's a bit, it's a, it's a like an overestimate of what other people will be exposed to. Because when you're talking to somebody across you know, that, that one meter space, some of your aerosols that you produce from your, your breathing activities will actually disperse past that person's breathing zone, and they will not be exposed to that amount of virus coming out of that person's mouth or nose. But this Gesundheit 2 machine is quite useful to, to gather everything so you can actually see where you're coming from. And um, the other side of this, and this is something that WHO have, have been asking for 
in previous years is that not only do you have to collect virus identified by PCR, RNA, you have to collect virus that can be grown in culture to show it's viable. Okay, so the two different issues here. One is how much of the virus in the mouth comes out? How much of that virus is then viable to then infect other people? And there's several problems with this because a lot of these samplers, including this one, the G2, is that when they collect the sample, so collecting the sample, you have to have some form of suction if you want to capture everything, otherwise the virus gets lost in the environment. And you have to have some kind of trapping system. So either suction negative pressure uh, through an air sampler, or this kind of cone, which may allow you to capture more virus at a lower kind of uh, shear force collection uh, mechanism. And then you then what this machine does is separates into like a fine fraction, less than five microns across, and large coarse fraction, greater than five microns across. And then that separation process, and then the kind of distilling of that uh, air, air based virus into a liquid and pinger or solid surface collection, you lose more virus doing that, and you lose more virus viability doing that as well. So, what you end up with is typically if you have like 10 million viruses or 100 million viruses, you may exhale about 10,000. So you lose about 10 to the fourfold of those viruses. Then of that 10,000, you might actually find that only 1% or 0.1% is actually viable virus, okay? Now, is this realistic? If I'm talking to somebody across a one meter space and they inhale my virus, which has not undergone any major shear stress in exhalation or inhalation, and then do I, is the viral load that causes infection much lower than would be indicated uh, compared to these, these studies uh, with artificial uh, collection mechanisms? And the answer is almost certainly yes. But the thing is, because you can see how fast the virus transmits in real life, but trying to just demonstrate this in an artificial collection system with an artificial cell culture system, which is often not human-based, you know, uh, you know, NDCK cells for, for influenza, viral E6 cells uh, are human-based to some extent, but the in vitro culture is not. Uh, it's very difficult to actually reach this level of uh, demonstration of, of evidence. Next slide, please. So that was one way of capturing the cone capture system with a breakdown of RNA copies and the viable virus copies. This other system developed by a Chinese team is where the patient basically just blows into a straw type tube-like device as you get exhale breath, as they called breath condensate, carrying virus, uh, aerosized virus or virus in solution into that tube. And they found that, that you can collect millions of viruses you know, per hour doing this, which is basically replicating what you pick up from the swab. So this is sl slightly different from the Gesundheit machine where in fact this, this collection might be a mixture of airborne, but also virus in solution, uh, in the collection solution of your saliva going into that kind of tube as a kind of spit rather than a true airborne virus. So the viral, the viral loads are quite high, which reflects the swab viral loads. So it shows that, okay, the virus can definitely come out in different, uh, different media and be collected, but how much of that virus is viable? And that's where the, the problem lies. Next slide, please. The other issue, and this is very common in engineering, I've read many studies in engineering looking at you know, airborne uh, bacteria, fungi, looking at environmental uh, contamination with these different um, organisms. Viruses are different, they need a host to replicate in, but you can still air sample from the environment. And then you, then you try to actually uh, quantify them with RNA uh, PCR. And they also try and grow them. And this is very hard because although the virus might be exhaled and the air hangs around for a long time, it may be affected by different airborne pollutants uh, to air temperature and relative humidity uh, factors. But also when you sample the virus from the air, often these air samples are actually quite violent. Uh, you know, the SKC virus samplers, even the NEOS sampler, they need some kind of uh, negative vacuum uh, produced by some kind of um, pump uh, or cyclone mechanism. And, and these lipid envelope viruses like influenza, like coronaviruses, can be uh, fragmented and sheared uh, in this process and you lose the surface attachment proteins that then no longer render the virus viable in culture uh, or in, in humans. So this study by Lednicki et al. from the Florida team used a, a much gentler uh, condensating collection system in the Biospot uh, air sampler. And they managed to isolate, um, and isolation means culture in virology, uh, at least some viable virus. But if you look at the, um, the, the viral load, uh, it's quite low. Okay, so the viable counts in areas like 74 liters uh, 
74 grams per liter of viable virus. And in fact, this is uh, based on a reduction factor from the RNA copy number, uh, which is uh, could be a hundred times to a thousand times higher than this. So in fact, the in from these studies, it looks like the kind of if you like the reduction factor of RNA copy number to viable virus number could be a thousand to ten thousand times lower. But that clearly has enough um, infectious potential to, to cause the spread of the virus, because that's what we see in real life. Okay, so clearly there must be enough viable virus there, and this is probably a, an, an, est, an underestimate based on, uh, based on the experiment compared to the actual natural transmission between two people talking, for example, across a one meter space. Next slide, please. So again, another study actually done in Leicester uh, some years ago, uh, using just viral culture, no PCR, they air sampled um, large volumes of air using a high throughput sampler in a pediatric ward full of bronchiolitis patients. And these bronchiolitis uh, babies have lots of RSV in their upper respiratory, upper respiratory tract. They're very distressed. They have breathing difficulties and they probably cough a lot and spew a lot of virus into the air. And our, our team here collected these in the air sampler and quantified the viral load directly actually by plaque forming units, which is a virus culture method. And they found that over the sampling period of 30 minutes, they got, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of airborne RSV that could uh, grow in culture. Now, of course, this is very, uh, looks like, looks very convincing, okay. Um, RSV is typically seen as a kind of short range droplet transmitting a transmitting virus. And this is the first study and one of the only few studies actually that show airborne RSV that's viable in the air. And the idea is that if you have airborne virus in the air, whether it's flu or SARS-CoV or RSV, <clears throat> people walking through that cloud of virus in the air can inhale it and then they get infected and that's how the virus transmits through the air. So this is really, again, <clears throat> it, it is a potential for transmission. Okay, it's very hard to share that the virus goes from baby A to the air and the person B walks past and inhales the air and then gets the virus infection in the absence of any other source of exposure to that virus in a season where that virus is circulating quite routinely through the population. Even if you do viral sequencing, the virus sequence from the baby and the person may match a third person, say a home contact, where he may have got the virus from as well, particularly if they have young children at home. So showing this kind of direct transmission is very difficult and it's more difficult because of the multiple source inputs that are available compared to say food poisoning. Okay, where food poisoning you have you know, E. coli positive salad or orange juice and it's in one place and it's very clear where it's come from and where it's gone to. And that's why aerosol transmission studies are very tricky and very easy, easily open to criticisms by those who don't want to actually uh, believe in it or trust it. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so again, this is just another example where air, uh, environmental air sampling, this is in the South Korean outbreak in 2015 of the massive uh, so-called hospital shopping outbreak in South Korea, where one person got infected, went back to South Korea and shopped across three different hospitals and, and seeded the virus across three different hospitals, patients and staff. And they found viable virus, again, culture positive, uh, from air samples taken in corridors and wards and, and near patient beds. So <clears throat> that's really the best we can do from an aerosol environmental sampling situation. Tracking the virus from person to person and showing that um, person A gave it to person B in the absence of any other uh, source is very difficult unless you design it in the study. Now, I haven't gone through the image study here, but a study done in um, 2007, I think it was, um, or 2009, I can't remember, uh, with Don Milton uh, and colleagues, um, looked at a group of volunteers who were artificially inoculated with influenza and given a certain situation to expose each other in, in a hotel, quarantine hotel for two weeks. Uh, and Kath was involved with this, actually, she'll know more about this, and really exposed people to different uh, levels of virus, uh, according to different levels of PPE they were wearing as sources or uh, as recipients. And they found that in fact, the virus they used, the lab strain um, that was artificially inoculated through nasal inoculation didn't really transmit. And we know that that's not true because in every season we see influenza transmitting across different populations. We may not know who transmits to who, but we see the, the transmission across the populations. We know it transmits quite easily. We've known that for decades. So there is a gap between the experiments and the studies and what happens in real life. And that gap <coughs> is where you get all the 
the doubting Thomases come in and say, you know, we don't need that intervention because you can't demonstrate ABC. Okay, and this is a this is a really major problem if you want to convince people to spend hundreds of millions upgrading all the ventilation systems across the country to to uh, prevent airborne COVID. Well, of course, that will prevent other things like airborne flu and RSV, etc., as well. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so. What we've got, you've got the environmental argument. So the virus is there, we can sample it, we can show it's viable, it's in the air. Okay, the problem is we can't track it through different people to show it's transmitted from person to person with a kind of uh, undeniable pathway of transmission. Okay, and that's very difficult. Even for thermite transmission, touch transmission, that a lot of our IPC colleagues, you know, absolutely believe is gospel. There's no such evidence for this because you don't know whether they've got it from somewhere else. Okay, and this is always the problem in outbreak investigations. So let's look at the epidemiological argument. And basically this is often retrospective. Uh, <clears throat> you've got some fantastic studies like on the Amo Gardens uh, back in 2003 of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS -CoV outbreak there, looking at the number of cases and then backtracking to how those cases must have been exposed to you know, broken sewage pipes and uh, convection currents, et cetera. And this is always the problem. Whenever you have an outbreak, you don't have the equipment there to do a real time tracking of these cases, because then you have to predict the outbreak. And the only way you can do that is actually induce it in a volunteer study, like with the IMIT study that I mentioned earlier for influenza, uh, run by Don and in fact, Jonathan Van Tam, who's our CMO, was the actual uh, PI lead in, uh, in Nottingham. So let's have a look at this, this kind of type of evidence. Next, please. <clears throat> so, okay. This is a nice study of a SARS-CoV situation in a church in uh, Australia. And over a couple of days, this chorister was singing uh, solos from a balcony, uh, three to four meters above the audience in the, in the church. And you can see from the diagram there, the blue and the greens are the secondary cases on different days. And this chorister, this, this choir soloist was actually uh, facing the piano while was singing. Uh, and this aerosol produced by this infected chorus does spread across the auditorium and infected those people. And the reason I chose this is that they actually did viral sequencing. And if you look at the viral sequencing on the right there, this is a phylogenetic tree. Um, you may not be familiar with this, but basically if all those cases are aligned in a single vertical um, group, it generally means that the virus is virtually identical across the whole group. And you see case one is the index case and all the other cases line up, uh, line up along that and you can see that there's a root at the bottom. These cases are more close to the case one than anything else that they show here. Now there's a slight issue here that there's, there's very few background population controls in this, but um, you know, Australia was very well controlled in terms of COVID and a bit like China, they went for a zero elimination, uh, complete elimination policy, a zero tolerance policy. So there were no other community cases of COVID to compare them with. So it had to come from here. And that's the theme that I'll touch on later on, that if it's a novel agent in a new population, any cases in there must come from an identified index case, unless you have asymptomatic index cases as well that you don't know about. And that's also a problem. So this is one case of a nice chain of transmission in a relatively isolated population in a otherwise relatively COVID-free community. So these these, these secondary cases are, you know, three to 10 meters away to 50 meters away from this chorister who was in the balcony, had no contact transmission, touched no surfaces that were common to the uh, secondary cases. So it had to be long range airborne transmission. And this chorus that was singing, that fits what we know about the physics of singing and aerosol dispersion. Next slide, please. This is a different type of study where this is actually a clinical setting where, um, doctors or nurses and their patients were masked uh, to some extent. And despite the regular masking, which is what I've shown in the picture there, is a basic surgical mask with the goggles on for eye protection. Despite that masking, they still got they still got infected. Now, we know that the surgical mask is not foolproof against aerosol transmission. The goggles might be if they fit tight, but the, the leakage around the side of the mask is probably what caused these doctors and nurses to get infected from their patients uh, in this study. And again, this study has viral sequencing to show the identity between the patient's virus and the healthcare worker who got infected from that exposure. Now, again, that's not foolproof because in a epidemical uh, outbreak situation, 
uh, all the viruses in that outbreak uh, population and probably in the community as well might be very similar because that's where the viruses come from. So although the virus sequencing helped to pin this down, it's not absolutely foolproof, but you know, what else can we do? The only thing you could do is actually sample everybody in the community in that population and see whether the cluster from this exposure on the ward nests within the community cases. And that has been done for HIV and other studies, uh, but sampling all the community population here. And even then, you may not pick up an asymptomatic case that wasn't sampled, wasn't actually uh, included in the, in the study, in the analysis. And that could be contributing to the, some of these, these cases independently, uh, uh, staff cases independently of that patient exposure. So it's very tricky to deal with this epidemiologically. Next slide, please. So this is a nice study. I include this because smallpox, measles, chickenpox are actually aerosol uh, systemic infections, uh, aerosol respiratory uh, systemic infections. They spread the virus by aerosol, but in fact, it causes systemic infection in them. And the most typical of this is a rash. So fever, febrile rash illness, measles, chickenpox, smallpox, they have a systemic infection. You have viral load shed into oral pharynx that's shed to the outside, and you can get airborne, long distance airborne spread. And this study shows uh, towards the end of the, the smallpox pandemic in 1969, 1970, that this German hospital had a case of smallpox, index case, that didn't have any contact with all these secondary cases, but they just had a room with an open window and a, a nearby open stairwell. And the virus actually spread through the building uh, to secondary cases around the hospital. Uh, they didn't have viral sequencing then, they just used virus isolation and epidemiological, traditional epidemiological um, methods and excluded fermite transmission, face-to-face -face contact transmission as a uh, transmission modality for this outbreak. And I think it's a, it's a very nice study, especially done in 1969 with just virus isolation uh, available for virus confirmation. Next slide, please. <coughs> okay, so you've got, what you've got so far, you've got uh, airborne virus you can sample, and you've got a infected population and outbreak that you can identify the virus in with viral sequencing if needed. So if that, if that outbreak situation can only have occurred through aerosol transmission, and we've shown virus in the air, okay, what else can we do to convince people that a, an infection is aerosol transmitted, right? There's like nothing else we can do unless we, we can see the virus moving through the air, which you know, we can't yet, okay? So the other way to look at this is the interventional argument. So if we put, an intervention X in, in place that protects against aerosols or protects against fermites rather and droplets, large droplets, then what must be left must be aerosol transmitted. Okay. And vice versa, if you block aerosols but allow fermite and contact transmission and droplet transmission, and if there's no transmission happening, then again, that lack of transmission must be because you block the aerosol route. Okay, so let's have a look at that now. Next slide, please. <coughs> So I mentioned earlier that if you stop people from touching their nose and their mouth, uh, despite having you know, virus contaminated uh, playing cards, for example, then if they still get infected, it can't be from direct contact by touching themselves, uh, nose, mouth, uh, self-inoculation. And there's lots of concern about people wearing masks in public and then self-inoculating through the touching of the outside of the mask. That doesn't really happen for several reasons. One is that the mask traps the virus very well. And two, in fact, if you look at the mask, people wearing the mask, they can't actually touch their nose and mouth very easily. Uh, and there have been very, in fact, there have been very few reports of this actually happening. So that kind of um, myth, I think, died a death. Uh, and the other myth that died a death is that if you wear a mask, you engage in more risky behaviors, you, you actually congregate in larger crowds, et cetera, et cetera. That risk compensation hypothesis was also actually debunked as well. Okay, so, so that, there's lots of expert opinion which actually turns out to be wrong in this situation. This study was done on rhinoviruses uh, by uh, colleagues at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, those of you in the USA will know this is, this is a very famous experiment. And some of this was actually uh, done in Portland down in the UK as well. And what they did is they, they restrained these participants uh, by these diabolical restraints, uh, one commentator mentioned. So they couldn't actually uh, touch their face. So they couldn't self-inoculate, okay? So then, a lot of them got infected. There's a 56 to almost 70% attack rate in these volunteers. It had to be through some of the means, and the only other, any other means was aerosol. Okay, so by by preventing one or two modes of transmission and allowing a third 
that they get uh, infections, it must be due to a third mode of transmission. Okay, unless you think the virus can jump up from the desk and hit you in the face, which I think is, is not, not viable. Next, please. So in a way, Don Milton's covered this base as well. What he did is got some of his volunteers to wear masks or not wear masks. And he found that even if you wear a mask, uh, some of the fine particles actually do leak out and can be viable at the end of that gazillion height to collection device. So if you wear a mask, virus leaks out then, and it can be viable uh, downstream. You know that even wearing a mask may allow virus to leak. And the, virus, the, the mask, if you look at the coarse particles, which are above five microns here, so not above 100, but he's used five microns as a cutoff here, this earlier study. The larger droplets are caught by the mask, which is not surprising. Okay, but the fine droplets get out, they, they actually go around the side of the mask and expose other people around them to the virus and the airborne uh, particles produced. So that kind of implies that, you know, there must be some element of aerosol transmission if this is allowed. And again, this is just the source end of the argument. There's no recipient at the other end of this, okay? And that was, Part of what the image study was supposed to designed to actually show that that had other problems uh, with the type of virus and the way it was inoculated. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, this is a more recent study uh, by Nancy Leng in Hong Kong, where she looked at, again, using the Gesundheit machine, looking at different viruses, not just influenza, how they were released <clears throat> from the mask, or how much the virus, how much virus could be captured by the mask and not released. And they found that <clears throat> rhinovirus was very efficient at, at escaping from the mask. Um, so without the mask, with the mask, it made no difference if you look at the kind of um, viral copies picked up by the Gesundheit machine downstream of that. The larger particles, again, uh, were mostly captured, uh, but not entirely uh, when you're wearing the mask, but the fine particles were hardly ever captured. If you look at the next slide, <clears throat> You see that the other viruses, coronaviruses, were actually well captured by both uh, by the mask at both greater than five microns and less than five microns. So the masks do seem to work against coronaviruses, as in SARS-CoV-2. <clears throat> and with influenza, it's partial. So the large droplets are captured by the mask. But there is an airborne component of influenza leaking from the mask at less than five micron levels. So influenza is partially airborne. Uh, coronavirus seems to be completely airborne, and coronavirus seems to be uh, captured mostly by the mask. Now, of course, in real life, um, this is th these are common called coronaviruses. Uh, and with SARS-CoV-2, which is a novel coronavirus against which we have very little immune exposure, these results are different. And we certainly see evidence of aerosol transmission as shown earlier for SARS-2 coronavirus transmission. So although masks uh, do seem to work for coronavirus here, we know that in fact, uh, coronavirus is, is, is airborne and can escape the mask as well. And these mass studies show that on average, a, a surgical mask may reduce the outgoing aerosol by about two to fourfold, and also reduce the incoming aerosol by two to fourfold. Um, and so if you multiply those together for universal masking, you get a reduction of about four to 16 fold if you want to be very precise about it. And cloth masks seem to reduce outgoing aerosols by, by 50%, twofold, and incoming aerosols by 50% by twofold. So again, the combination might be fourfold. And this has been shown by Lindsay Marr as well as Others, including a very nice UK study uh, using mannequin heads <coughs> um, back from, 19, from 2008, so even before the pandemic flew in 2009. It also shows FFP2, FFP3 masks. The containment um, factor, the reduction factor is like 10 to 1,000 fold. So those uh, FFP2 and 95 or FFP3 masks uh, without any valves um, are very good at containing the virus uh, and also very good at shooting you from incoming virus as well. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so just to summarize, uh, I think I've gone over time a bit, but um, these three uh, kind of, uh, if you like, evidence uh, bases or bases for evidence of the kind of transmission mode is something we can use to understand how infection control teams really um, think about this and what kind of evidence they want to see before we can convince them it's aerosol transmitted or not. Now, to be honest, as engineers, you, you may not be making this decision. Uh, you may be following what people ask you to do in infection control uh, circles, but hopefully we're changing that uh, in the sense that you know, engineers can now maybe advocate uh, for these interventions, especially given the experience of COVID over the last 18 months. The other thing I should mention is that, <clears throat> let's just go to the next slide. This is the last slide. <clears throat> 
next slide, please. Yeah, so this is the last slide. So the R0, so looking at R0 is tricky. People can say that, oh, if it's a high R0, it must be airborne. If it's a low R0, it can't be airborne. That is not true. Okay, so R0 is very tricky to define, but it's easy to define, it's hard to actually uh, count. So you need to, um, what it says is that it's the number of secondary cases for any given index case in a totally susceptible population, uniformly distributed, you know, with no boundaries, no immune protection, et cetera, et cetera. So if I took a person with measles and put them into a uniformly distributed uh, non-immune population, you might get 15 to 17 cases uh, coming up over the next two weeks. Okay, with flu, uh, you put a case of flu in there, it could be like two cases, put a case of Delta COVID, a Delta variant COVID in there, SARS-CoV-2, you might get five to eight cases. Okay, uh, chickenpox, you might get 10 cases, uh, mumps, rubella, you might get say nine cases. <clears throat> But the thing is, you have to be able to identify and count those cases. So with COVID, with flu-like illness and with asymptomatic infection, it's very hard to pick up the secondary cases unless you stand there and you look at who was there and you go and test all of them over the next two weeks, you know, the, the, the extreme of the incubation period. And also, if some of them do have past immunity through cross-reactive uh, immunity through common cold coronaviruses or other coronaviruses, that R0 will be mitigated. And then you, you go to something called the RE, the effective R0 in real, uh, effective R in real life. So just be careful of uh, over-interpreting or misusing the R0 as an indicator for, um, if you like, the transmissibility of mode of transmission of these different viruses. So um, I think that's it. And, uh, I hope that clarifies things. Thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Julian, and for the very informative and, and also inspiring to me uh, the talk and uh, offering us a, a new hypothesis that all respiratory infection perhaps are transmitted by aerosol transmission. We we'll come back to you later on for the discussion. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's really my great pleasure again to introduce our second distinguished speaker. Professor uh, Kathy Noakes, and uh, we also collaborated. So Kath is a chartered mechanical engineer with a background in fluid dynamics, the same as me. And she lay, lays research into ventilation in the air quality and effective control uh, using uh, experimental modeling-based studies. So Kath is currently deputy director of Lee's Institute for Fluid Dynamics and co-director of EPSRC Center for Doctoral Training in Fluid Dynamics. Since April 2020, she has been involved in the COVID-19 response, leading the environment and modeling subgroup of UK scientific advisory group for emergency, and well known as a SAGE, uh, focusing on the science and the pinning environmental transmission of COVID-19. With her scientific achievement, she has become a, a fellow of Royal Society of Engineering, fellow of Institute of Mechanical Engineer, Engineering, a fellow of uh, uh, Institute of Healthcare Engineering, and of course, fellow of ESEA. So has recently as awarded, as uh, uh, Professor Pavel uh, Wagowski mentioned, uh, uh, the officer of the Order of British Empire, Empire OBE for her dedicated service to the COVID-19 response. We are very proud of her achievement. Kath, welcome you. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, Hugo. Very kind introduction. Um, okay, and so thank you for inviting me to come and talk today. So I'm gonna to touch on a couple of different things today. First of all, I want to talk a bit about, I guess to follow on from what Julian has said around transmission, the uncertainty around that transmission, thinking about the complexity and modeling that, what that might mean for future buildings and ventilation. And then just to touch on some of, I guess, the experience I've had over how to give some of this as scientific advice to policymakers. Um, so if I can get that to work. Um, so, I mean, I think Julian's already talked a bit about transmission. I mean, we it is a, a respiratory disease. And if we think through the different pathways in which it can transmit, we can represent this in, in multiple different ways, but essentially it transmits through a wide range of respiratory particles. The relative importance of these, um, these different sizes of particles are still not truly known, even though I think it's becoming clearer and clearer that inhalation of uh, aerosols is, is the, the dominant route. Um, and in here, although I have split air, that inhalation into two, so I've called airborne 
the longer range in shared rooms and I've called the closer stuff close range which is um, inhalation of both the small and large aerosols and of course exposure to some of the, the much larger droplets um, but I think those two modes dominate um, although the surface transmission is probably a much lower component I don't think we've got enough evidence to say it doesn't exist at all. Um, so I think it's important that that still gets considered in the mix. Um, when we come to start trying to understand transmission, I mean, one of the real big challenges is the vast number of factors that come together to enable that transmission to happen. So there are factors that influence the chance that somebody infected is going to be present in a particular environment. Um, there are factors then that are going to uh, determine which are the, uh, the important modes of transmission that might matter within that environment. There are then factors such as your time you spend there and the proximity to people which you were going to determine how the, your chance of being exposed to that virus. And then even when you are exposed to that virus, there will be then a bunch of factors that determine whether you um, are actually infected or not you know so do, do you actually receive sufficient virus to cause infection and that will be influenced by uh, things like the, the, the whether you're vaccinated on the variant but also you know whether you're exposed once or whether you have repeat exposures um, and also I think transmission route comes in there so even if we are exposed for example through fomites um, does that actually lead to infection in, in as easily as for example inhalation I quite possibly doesn't, but I don't think we truly know that yet. Um, and again, Julian touched on some of this already, but we have different routes to finding that evidence for transmission. Um, and, you know, the, the, I've grouped into two groups here, the, the different types of studies that we can do to understand transmission. The first line, the blue boxes, are really the, 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 the uh, population scale data, so data from outbreaks, data from testing and tracing, data from sequencing, um, data from cohort and case control studies. All of these are obviously real world. They, they tell us where the virus is circulating. They tell us the population level numbers. They can tell us regional variations, geographic variations, and they can tell us some things about um, actual outbreaks, but they're always in the past. They're always, um, they are real world, but they're in the past. They don't tell us the actual nitty gritty detail of how that virus transmitted person to person. The bottom line in the green are some of the mechanisms we can use to try and understand how that transmission happens. So we can use various animal models to um, look at emission rates, to look at dose response, to look at uh, modes of transmission. We can put laboratory type studies. Uh, we can do studies with human so, um, volunteers, uh, such as the, the G2 machine that Don Milton has. And we can use various mathematical models looking for the physics and the epidemic modeling of, of transmission. So these will tell us something more about the mechanisms, but we've got to put them together. No one study on its own is going to give us the answer. And we have to put all of these bits of the jigsaw together. Uh, one of the real big challenges when we come to model some of this is viral load. So if we simply take nasopharyngeal swabs or throat swabs, um, we see that um, the graph on the, the very left hand graph here, that there is a huge range of viral load that's been measured with people with uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's about 12 orders of magnitude. This seems to change by variant. So we seem to get sort of some of the more transmissible variants tend to have that curve skewed towards the higher end. Um, but what we've got there is a, a real big challenge when it comes to modeling. And on the right, it's actually just a very simple risk model, which looks at um, the, the sort of exposure that you might get in a, a small room between two people and looking at what might happen if you increase ventilation rates or put masks on the infector or the susceptible in there. And what you see is that all of those measures subtly shift the mean. They shift it by maybe one order of magnitude, but the actual risk is completely dominated by this vast viral load. And it makes it actually very hard to model because the minute you include viral load in the model, you've got this huge range to deal with, which is, a, a, and we don't really know, it's probably only the very top end that actually matters. Um, and this also translates into, um, particularly things like the role of ventilation. So, 
these are our set of graphs looking at whether somebody's in a, a, an environment over which is steady state or where they've all come into the environment together, which is transient, using a Wells Riley model, so looking at quanta as the as the to do emission rates, and looking at the difference between from one quanta per hour to 100 quanta per hour for people under different ventilation rates and different times in a venue. And what you see is that when you've got a low emission rate, uh, at one quanta per hour, the risks are pretty low and they only start to creep up with very, very low ventilation. But once you get high, high um, emission rates, you see there's a really big range of risks and it's very hard to pull it down to, in this case, below about uh, 20%. So I think, again, this means that our one intervention May, might have a very different impact depending on the emission rates and of course that's something we just don't know for many cases. I want to talk about two studies we've been doing to try and quantify some of this, um, this, this uncertainty, two very different studies. The first one is a modelling based study, so this is a we are I'm, I'm still working on this, but it's uh, around transport risks and looking to try and develop um, risk models for typical transport scenarios. We're bringing information from different types of um, different data into there. So from environmental sampling, from some ventilation studies, from user demographic studies and from some CCTV characterization of people. I'm trying to put all this together to understand transmission. And one of the key models that we've uh, worked on, uh, been developing so far, which um, hopefully will be published in a, um, a few weeks' time. Um, it takes a while. Um, is is a, a risk model where we've looked at a typical subway type train. Um, we based this on a, a study from a, um, a few years ago, Leotard, which looked at transmission risk on an aircraft and, and to use the sort of simple methodologies. But essentially, we have like a source term for respiratory activity, which represents the aerosol distribution. Uh, we have a single viral load in this, so we don't deal with that massive variation in viral load that dominates the stochasticity of it. Um, and then we look in here, we, we, we split our exposure into long range airborne, close range airborne and fomite transmission. Um, at long range, we assume it's a five micron dry diameter. So those would obviously start larger, typically around up to about 20 microns would dry down to that. Um, the, the close range will deal with the larger aerosols as well. Long range is a fully mixed um, environment. Close range, we, we have some zones of one and two meters and we look at the proximity based on passenger density. And then we also model fomite transmission through um, con contaminated hands of the infectious person and a uh, coughs which will release um, particles into the environment who then touch a fixed number of surfaces during their when they board and alight the, trans the, the, the transport vehicle. Um, we look at passenger loading it's an agent based model so we, we have people who will enter and depart at each station and then and it's a stochastic model which will look at uh, determine whether that person is infectious or not. Um, and then so we, we have to model multiple runs of the, this, this um, subway journey in order to calculate um, the, the exposure and the cumulative dose by each route. We then put a, a bunch of other factors in there, such as mask wearing to, um, to deal with the mitigations. So I want to just show you a couple of results and you know, these, please treat these as, as um, relative as opposed to absolute value. So the actual numbers where it says the amount of dose the virus received is, is you know, it is what, what is calculated for the particular viral load. Um, the viral load is, is in PFU per mil, it's about 10 to the six. That's around about a viral load of 10 to the eight RNA copies, or maybe 10 to the nine, depending on how you, re your relationship between RNA copies and PFU. Um, our baseline parameters are shown there. We have a very high ventilation rate because this is actually based on some data from a particular train, but I will show you some variation in ventilation rate in a minute. What was quite interesting when we started running these models was how the different routes give us different um, distributions of risk. So the uh, close range is dominated completely by chance events. So if you are close to that person, you get a high risk. 
Um, and so the, there are some very high outliers there and the mean is high, but the actual median is, you can't see it at zero, it's a line on the, on the, on the bottom axis of the graph. The same is true with fomite. So again, fomite is something that's a, probably a low probability event, but there are a small number of high outliers, which then dominate the mean. Uh, we do get a bit of an interquartile range with the fomite, but the median exposure is still zero. But the airborne route is quite interesting in that this one is it because everybody gets the same um, be, because we've, we've got a well mixed assum model assumption. The median and the mean are very close together. And so it's the airborne dose that it's that dominates the median exposure. Um, but we don't have those high outliers in the same way. And this is, I'll show you why this is important in a minute when I've just gone through a couple of the other results. So we looked at, we can look, use this to look at the effect of different parameters. We've looked at loads of different parameters, including some of the input parameters like the, the model we assume for the, um, the, breathe, uh, the, the aerosol emissions. If we look at ventilation, we can see, as you might expect, it changes the airborne airborne dose and we've got some quite big ranges of ventilation in here because uh, subway carriages can be can have quite a range of ventilation most are pretty well ventilated though you'd expect to typically around 30 plus air changes an hour in most subway carriages because of the uh, the way they're designed and the way that you get a huge amount of air rush through the tunnels um, obviously ventilation um, changes that airborne dose it doesn't substantiate do very much at all to close range or fomite doses in this model. Um, if we look at the prevalence of virus and the system loading, these make some really quite big differences. And, and once you start going, uh, you get to higher prevalence, you start to see not just the high outliers um, increase, but you see that the, the chance of having infectious people on your transport goes up quite significantly and it, you know you start to see the median and the mean the distributions narrowing and coming together as the prevalence goes up because essentially you've now got the chance of an infectious person on nearly every journey as opposed to it being a rare event and the same is true with loading you get a similar behavior goes on uh, probably the most significant um, intervention that the model shows is mask wearing because mask wearing will impact on all of the transmission modes so it brings down uh, if you increase your mask wearing it brings down the median exposure because that's reducing the airborne dose but it brings down the, the mean exposure even higher even more so because it's reducing those close range exposures and the fomite exposures so it's reducing the chance events it's bringing down the outliers as well as the median exposure and when and i mentioned the the importance of, of the ventilation. So if we look at relative exposure, we, we've got three scenarios here where we've got the sort of baseline, which I've already shown you. We've then got a real worst case scenario. We, we take our ventilation right down, we take the mask wearing off, we put lots of people on the carriage and we bump up the prevalence. And then we've got a case, a, a third case where we've got a really sort of good compliance and low prevalence. Um, now, if we were to say, um, the infectious dose, uh, and I, I'm going to hope that Charles Hass isn't on here because he doesn't like my way using the word infectious dose, but let's just treat it as a single threshold value for now, uh, just to simplicity. If we said the infection, the amount of virus you needed to receive was um, one virus, which is on the, on the graph here, which is shown by the blue line, you would see that actually it's quite rare that you're going to be infected, that there is a very small number of outlier cases which are going to cross that, even in our worst case scenario. But if we had a, a higher viral load um, or lower infectious dose, we might say that the, the threshold comes down. And then we start to see that in our baseline case, it's still only the outliers, but now our um, Poor, poor, uh, poorly ventilated case with high prevalence and no mask wearing, it's now sitting right firmly in the middle of that distribution. We're getting really close to the median and that's telling us lots of people are getting that exposure, which is then predominantly dominated by the airborne. And if we brought it down even further, we could see that we would now be in a situation where that airborne exposure is gonna dominate. So we can sort of use these types of models to look at the um, when it's gonna be these low relatively rare events, which might be the fomite dose or even that close range exposure, which happened by chance, compared to those conditions when it's going to be the airborne dose that might dominate.
A second study, this is a very different type of study, and this is only published uh, about a week ago, where we, we tried to bring together some work around uncertainty because, uh, you know, as Julian mentioned, there's been a lot of debate about, is it an aerosol, is it a droplet, what's the, what's the relative mode? And there's, you know, some of that is people sticking to their, their old ways of thinking. Some of it is just a lack of real good quality data and the, the real challenge in measuring this stuff. So we carried out a process of expert elicitation. We asked people from across disciplines, including some people who might be in this call, um, and got them to, we, we basically broke down transmission into different pathways. And we said, well, and we asked some very detailed questions about, well, how much virus do you think gets uh, it gets transferred from A to B via a particular size of aerosol or, or gets dropped out into the environment and we lose it along the way. So it was semi-quantitative, it's not a physics-based model, but we asked people lots of information and then pulled down that quantitative data together through the expert elicitation. And I'll just give you an example of, you know, we, we saw some quite big disparities in this. So we asked one of the questions, which was about the fraction of virus that's contained within different sized particles. And each line on these graphs represents different people who've, who've um, and, and, who responded. This was our round one, which was a smaller number of people who responded. And you see some quite big variations in that some people think, you know, it's nearly all in the, la in the small aerosols. Some people think it's nearly all in the very large particles. Some people who hedge their bets and say it can be right across the board. Um, and <clears throat> all of these were, it's very difficult to say anything were wrong, because they could all be backed up by some insight into the literature. But we took all of this information together and we've published it in a couple of papers. It's well worth it. If you've not seen this, it's a good fun bit thing to go and do. You can play with all the parameters. It's an interactive graphic and you can see um, how, you know, the, the relative effects of, of changing different parameters on transmission exposure. So, there's just some of the things we've done to try and think about capturing uncertainty. I just wanted to touch on sort of ventilation and future ventilation. I think there's an awful lot of questions being asked about ventilation. And I think fundamentally, there are some very difficult questions because it's one thing saying we must have, you know, CO2 values of a particular rate value or a particular rate of ventilation. But actually, we don't know what that ventilation rate is in most buildings. We don't know how it fluctuates. It's very challenging to measure. And the metrics that we need to, for health are quite difficult. We, you know, we, we can probably model how um, risk changes with ventilation rates to some extent, but it's very difficult to um, put, a num put some really hard numbers on the metrics that we need. Uh, and I think there is also a challenge with ventilation linking into uh, the, the, this one thing saying we need to have you know, 10 litres per second per person. But what does that look like in reality and how do people understand how to deliver that with the ventilation that they've got? Um, I think we, there's a lot of real world complexity. Just some examples here on the left, where you can see a stratification. This is um, one or two nice bits of smoke studies done in uh, by Yale School of Public Health and ice rinks, where you can see that actually there might be higher than you'd expect risks because of that stratification. On the right, some modeling we did a few years ago where we looked at what, what transmission risks you would get if you made assumptions about whether a space was incompletely mixed or fully mixed. And you see that assuming fully mixed actually can overestimate your, um, your uh, it, it, total number of uh, cases, but it will also underestimate the close range risks. Um, we can see if we look at things like a screen, uh, this is some quite nice CFD simulations that's been, been done as part of our uh, PROTECT study by colleagues at uh, Health and Safety Executive. Um, and here we've got a, a, you know, somebody generating uh, aerosols and droplets with a screen in the way. We can see that the screen does block those larger droplets and would, would also block very short duration exposure to aerosols. But at the same time, over only about five minutes, those aerosols get dispersed through the room. So we'd need to think through how uh, the ventilation interacts with other things in that space. Um, thinking through what this might mean for ventilation in the future, uh, a piece of work that we carried out over the summer with Royal Academy of Engineering and with SIPSI looked at um, a, a, a 
big exercise to look at uh, infection resilience in buildings and um, through again a series of expert input and through um, interviews with various stakeholders identified some of the challenges and questions and gaps um, flagged some immediate actions around communication guidance and incentives to ventilate buildings better were needed to manage the pandemic now but i think more importantly from the future identified there are some real strategic challenges out there we know we've got a legacy of poorly performing buildings actually what we lack there is some of the skills and knowledge as well as the right research and evidence to support how we change those buildings. And that's skills and knowledge in the industry, as well as feeding through uh, research. Um, we also recognize that actually the, the, a lot of the guidance is probably not too bad, um, but we, we lack the uh, evidence to show that, you know, that buildings actually do what they should do. Um, there's a, a, a real challenge in compliance. And I think there's a big future challenge, which I think, you know, um, EASYAC are well positioned to feed into, which is actually how do we tie up the net zero question, the building safety question with air quality and infection resilience? And where are those trade-offs? Because there will be some trade-offs. We, we can't deny that. Um, I think what you can see in the, all of these buildings is there are huge numbers of competing priorities in there. Most buildings are not designed in such a way to be infection resilient. In fact, the only buildings which probably are are hospitals and even they don't achieve it many times. But we have a huge number of competing priorities uh, and that needs to be acknowledged uh, and brought through into how we um, mitigate risks. Um, I think it's one thing I've learned quite a lot about is behaviour this year, which is really quite interesting how, particularly around ventilation. So, you know, there is this sort of dream of finding a magic bullet. You know, people have, uh, are looking at air cleaners, particularly magic bullet solutions. Can this be our saviour? Um, unfortunately, I don't think there are any magic bullets. There is no single saviour. Uh, policy would also love really simple messages. You know, we, we had messages at the beginning of the pandemic about wash your hands for 20 seconds while singing happy birthday birthday you know we can joke about that now but it is a simple message and it's stuck it's really hard to do the same simple message for ventilation because ventilation is difficult and I think getting that that across to people we have to do that but it's it's, it's a real challenge um, public knowledge of ventilation is quite challenging and I think we'll find it varies around the world um, but certainly in the UK it has been distilled down to opening a window and if your windows don't open you don't have ventilation which I think is not very helpful um, we need to make people more aware of the other forms of ventilation too. Uh, and it's not helped by the fact that people are less aware of uh, airborne transmission routes in there. I think there is some real challenges for organisations as well. Um, organisations lack, lack awareness about why it matters. They lack the skills and capacity to do things about it. And I think for many, there's a fear. There's a fear of what they will find and what the consequences is that, of, of that is for their organisation, and particularly smaller organisations who don't have sufficient funds find that very difficult. So I'm just going to finish up the last five minutes by talking about some of the work I've been doing over the past uh, about 18 months or so now. So I joined what's called the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies in the UK in April 2020. Um, I was invited to bring a paper um, on environmental dispersion of COVID-19. Um, that was the 14th of April when that brought that paper. At that same meeting, we were asked to form a subgroup to look at transmission. Um, we formed that group in a week. We delivered another paper a week after that. And I don't think we've actually stopped since. Um, but we have a remit to look at the evidence on transmission. An awful lot of this is pulling together the vast amount of literature and, and information from many, many of the people in this call will have been doing and the excellent work so yes thank you everybody who's done huge amounts of work because we do pull it all together and feed that into policy um, we bring together quite a cross-disciplinary expertise in here and put all that mess information to um, departments government departments uh, whether it all gets taken up is another question I think quite a lot of it doesn't um, but quite a number of in amongst the, the bits that haven't been listened to there has been a shift we have seen that that information being taken up and we have seen that changes in public messaging which has been really good to see um, 
I mentioned evidence. Um, some, somebody gave me this slide which looked at the uh, literature around uh, diseases, and you can see that in just in, in under two years, there are nearly as many hits for SARS-CoV-2 now as there are after influenza over, over a hundred year period. So it's a very challenging field to, to go through. There is a, a huge amount of literature uh, and I think it's very hard to keep on top of it all. And it's very hard for policymakers to keep on top of it all as well. Um, so one of the big challenges that we've had over the past 18 months is about how we communicate that evidence. So, you know, the looking for the quality in studies and looking for the we have to make sure we're careful of the caveats and we have but we have to then balance that with precautionary measures because at the end of the day we're making decisions and recommendations that might that will change what everybody does on a day-to-day -day basis um we find that lots of people need different types of information um, you can't tell everybody everything. You have to put it into simple languages. And sometimes that simple language is not the language that we would use scientists. Um, you know, uh, an aerosol for the public means a spray can. A droplet is obviously something that drops, so that one's quite easy. Um, ventilation, to start with, nobody liked the word ventilation because the, the, the focus groups who, who dealt with the public didn't understand ventilation. I think they're getting used to it now. Um, but fresh air was used instead because, vent and, and of course, ventilation also has a context of ventilators from early in the phase of the pandemic. Um, so it's been a real challenge there. So I'm just going to finish by saying um, we've learned, I think, an awful lot. Um, I think the more we learn, the more we discover there's more and more complexity in it. We'd love everything to be straightforward and it isn't. Um, there's still a lot of gaps in that knowledge, even though we're starting to fill them and we're getting more confident about them. Um, but there are challenges about how do we reflect this uncertainty in practice. I think I've seen an awful lot of cases where people have plucked one number from one study and used that as their argument. And yet, you know, we know that if you take a different study, you'll get a different answer. So I think we need to think much more carefully about how we share that uncertainty without using it as a reason to not do something. And then ultimately, we're going to have to figure out how to use this knowledge to improve our buildings going forward. So I will stop there. I know we're all massively over time, but hopefully people are still with us. Thank you, uh, Kathy. Absolutely inspiring. A lot of information, uh, uh, a new information. And I'm going to start to, to uh, there are quite a few questions. I, I need to go uh, first come, first serve, perhaps. So the first question to uh, Julian. Are you there, Julian? Yeah, so uh, some countries <clears throat> converted <coughs> exhibition hall or uh, other spaces into temporary and emergency hospital for a COVID-19 uh, COVID patient. But do you know that the ventilation was not designed for patient management, uh, infection push, uh, control purposes? So uh, there is a risk. So, um, and, and the post infection risk. So what is your opinion on this and how to tackle this issue? I mean, this temporary conversion. Uh, yes, yeah, so I've seen lots of those, um photos and some of my friends have uh, emailed me about this in Singapore and Hong Kong. These are big expo uh, high ceiling uh, spaces. And I, I, I have the feeling that those kind of spaces are probably safer than the, the, the average ward in the hospital because those hospital wards are very low ceiling, very crowded. Whereas in those spaces, assuming not every bed is full, you have much higher ceilings, even though the ventilation might be relatively limited uh, in those areas. And I think you have to do some proper measurements to see how badly those, those um, places are ventilated. Uh, but you've got people moving around, you've got thermal plumes, and so it's very hard to know how they compare with the average hospital ward that's already poorly ventilated, at least in the UK. Some of the SARS-CoV wards in Hong Kong and Singapore are actually very good. So compared to those standard wards in those hospitals, and I've worked there, uh, those hospitals will be much better ventilated than those expo places that are converted that may not have those ventilation uh, facilities. I don't think they even have portable HEPA filter ventilators, uh, portable air filters there either. So it depends on which hospital you compare them with. Uh, if you have the Singapore Hong Kong standard, which is very good post SARS 2003, this is the UK NHS standard, uh, which is pretty bad as Kath will say, then they may not be too bad. 
And I think those, you know, if you convert the Birmingham arena into like a multi bedded hospital, uh, they may have better ventilation in that large airspace than in the UK NHS that, you know, we work in. Julian, welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. So uh, I, we do have some more uh, questions, but uh, I know that later on there is a question about the monitoring. So we'll combine, come back to you. Okay, Kath, there is a, on the slide of route of exposure, I think referring to the indoor air paper, uh, talking about mask wearing uh, as baseline parameter. So there you showed, you know, how mask wearing affecting the results. So uh, uh, they ask, what kind of mask did you look there? Because they know there's a difference between clothed mask, surgical, ill fitted FFP, well fitted FFP, and so on. So, my, so those different masks might introduce differences in your results. Yes, they would. So this is quite a simple model. Um, this is is assuming a fairly generic mask type, and and I guess perhaps reflects the fact that there'll be a variation in what happens in reality. Um, I can't remember the exact numbers. I think we assume that it blocked. I can't remember if it was ninety or one hundred percent of the large droplets, and and perhaps it was fifty percent of the smaller aerosols. Um, we have got some more updated modeling, which we're doing at the moment, which has a, a more variation in some of the mass parameters and has got some stochasticity in that as well. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it would be something that you could put into the model and do some more significant investigation with. Um, but then you would have to say, well, do we assume everybody wears an FFP2 or will everybody wears a surgical mask or do we randomly allocate within the model? And the more stochasticity you put into the model, the longer it takes to run, <laughs> the more runs you have to do. Yeah. I think the, I mean, the paper will be published. So later on, yeah, we'll yeah. see the, uh, the details, uh, if people are interested. Uh, and there is one uh, uh, participants also ask whether you can share the link with on this interactive graphic. I don't know yeah. how to do it. Uh, oh, I'll try and do that. Account. I will try and do that while Julian's answering his yeah. next question. Yeah, well, but unfortunately, next question is still possibly to both of you. And the question is about, you know, the, of course, a defin uh, 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 definite scientific proof for airborne transmission is important, but from perspective of practical control of pandemics, why shouldn't the precautionary principle uh, be used <laughs> in the later acceptance of airborne transmission in those important <laughs> control without waiting for, you know, <laughs> for uh, <sighs> a definitive proof? I mean, and this is question to, I mean, being sent to all of us so, so often, but I like to hear your comments. So I, I, I think, I've gone, Julian, you go first. <laughs> well, no, maybe, I don't know whether Kath wants to go first. I want to hear what her view is on this. I, I have a view on this already, but I'm curious to see what the engineer is. Oh, Kath. So, so I think you should use precautionary approach, um, but to a point. So there is, there is a point which, you know, so there are some measures we can take, like wearing a mask, keeping a distance, etc., which are cheap. You know, they will have some some impacts on on particularly distancing, which has some impacts on how we manage society. But they're cheap to do. Ventilation measures. If you've got a huge number of poorly ventilated spaces, it takes it. It requires cost. It takes time, and we can't do them overnight. So we can't. You know, even simply saying, you know, let's put a HEPA filter in in every classroom. It sounds great in theory, but the the practicality of doing that is is hard. You have you have a supply chain, you have you don't have enough manufacturers, you don't have enough money to do it. And it costs a lot of money. Now, whether somebody should have put the money there on, over other things early on in the pandemic is another question. We can't go back to where we were. Um, I would like more precautionary principle in there, and I would certainly like to see more intervention in poorly ventilated spaces. Um, but it, 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 we cannot deliver ventilation measures overnight in most spaces. Julian, you're <coughs> yeah. So, so I mean, so on the ground, um, we had problems with masking right at the beginning because they weren't people said there weren't enough masks, no FFP twos, and very few surgical masks, uh, flu resistant masks. So. The, the availability really impacts on how people view that precautionary principle. And even, you know, our head of infection control was saying that masks, 
don't work in the community, but they do work in hospital, which is a ridiculous statement because they're trying to preserve the mass and keep them for the healthcare workers. So I think you need to be straight with people and say, look, you know, this will work to some extent, not black and white, not because most of the framing of the question in the media is, does it work or does it not work? In fact, everything works to some extent. And that's why I always say. So the question then becomes a relative kind of um, benefit. If you only have 100 masks and you've got 50 nurses who may use two masks a day working on COVID wards versus 100 people in the community who, who otherwise don't have a mask, who are you going to give the mask to? So the precautionary principle is actually you want to mask everybody. But if you want to uh, benefit those who are at most risk, you then to allocate the mask to those who are at most risk. So the precautionary principle is fine, but you need to have some stratification of risk assessment to then allocate your resources, which are always limited, uh, to those at high risk. And we had this problem in the UK as well, at the beginning with the testing. We didn't have enough reagents and kits to actually do the testing in the community, as well as in the hospital. So we abandoned the community testing, which was a mistake, I think, and the virus just, just basically amplified it in the community whilst you're just testing hospitalized patients. And then later on, you saw the hit from the amplification later on. So the, I think the precaution principle is actually um, it's a good one in principle, but in practice, as Kath is saying, it's very hard to actually allocate resources to fit that precautionary principle at the beginning of the pandemic, especially if you're not well prepared, like in the UK. Uh, it's much easier in some of the Southeast Asian countries where they actually have this inter-pandemic preparedness being funded and staffed. Uh, and I think it depends on the where, basically where you come from. And I'm curious to know who asked that question, because if they came from Southeast Asia, then they'd have a different perspective than if they came from, say, the West, uh, which has no experience of this kind of uh, virus. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm glad to tell you, but uh, also a lot of questions came in and, and perhaps we will. I'm sorry to the viewers, uh, some of uh, uh, the comments I will, I think it will be saved and shared with the speakers. Uh, and I don't know whether to, to participants, but I need to go on now. So Julian, you said engineers have, have been kept out of discussion on aerosols. Do you think there have been too much separation between biosafety expertise and infection control sector? Yeah, so I, I guess that question comes from an engineer because most of these people are engineers. It's very hard if you're not inside this infection control community, you didn't actually you know, grow up with them it's hard for you to understand the kind of, um, some of the kind of bizarre thinking that goes on. And, you know, looking at it from the outside, it's, it's clear that if you have a mouthful of virus and you're talking and breathing, coughing, you're gonna have aerosols spread across, you know, certain distances over time. But, trying, but the infection control people tend to kind of want to categorize these into certain blocks. And if it's a fomite, then aerosol can't happen. If it's fermite and droplet, then aerosol can't happen. And it's very difficult to get them out of this mind sink. Let me give you an example. So one of my colleagues said to me, well, do you know, it can't be aerosol because I go to the same supermarket every day and the same checkout girl is there every day. And she has this glass, this perspex barrier in front of her every day. And I see her there every day. So she's not getting sick and going off with COVID. So it can't be aerosol transmitted. And I didn't know what to say to that because there's so many reasons why that is complete nonsense. But he emailed me this question, a copy to all the infection control team and all the ID <laughs> infectious disease doctors. So I said, okay, look, this is your experience of N equals one with one supermarket checkout that was N equals one, and she may have natural immunity. You don't know if this is happening across the country with N equals, you know, you know, one million. Okay, that's the simplest way to deflect this. But the other things that could be happening, maybe the customers that see her are actually infected. That's another thing. This is at the beginning of the pandemic. So this kind of thinking is, is very bizarre sometimes. And the other question the same person asked actually, in, again in an email is, okay, so are you saying that if it's aerosol transmitted, droplets can't cause infection if they're inhaled to the back of the throat <laughs> with COVID? And I said, no. Droplets and aerosols behave the same way. If you inhale, if you can inhale them and they have virus, they can cause infection, whether they go to the back of the throat or into the deep lung. Because their mindset is that aerosols, airborne droplet nuclei, go to the deep lung, cause infection that way. But droplets cannot do that. Okay, so therefore, if they go to the back of the throat and stay there, they're droplets. If they get inhaled into the deep lung, they're aerosols, and they're, they're the two are separated. And you can't answer this kind of question because it's just so bizarre. <laughs> 
without causing offence, because to them, that is how it works. And I think if that isn't how it works, you can have droplets hitting anywhere in your oropharynx and you can get an infection from it. So it's very hard to talk to um, the two different groups if you're not part of the two different groups. So I can talk to engineers because I've worked with you for 20 years and I, you know, I have a PhD in, in, in biological fluid dynamics and I've worked with engineers for that, but I also grew up in the medical field as well. And I can see the, the dichotomies and the kind of irrationalities on both sides, okay, because engineers can't understand why maybe some infection of people do certain things because the physics doesn't match, but they do it because, you know, there's a lot of psychology, it makes them feel better. Washing hands makes people feel better, even though it doesn't work. There are lots of bus drivers who got SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 in the early first wave in, in London, and they washed their hands until they were bleeding from their hands, and they still got SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, some of them died. And, you know, the family says they washed their hands until they were bleeding and still got COVID and died because they didn't have masks. Okay, and they were asking for masks, they never got them. And when they brought their own masks, they were told off for bringing the masks and asked to remove them. And that's the kind of bizarre environment, you know, infection control people live in. And engineers, I think, are much more rational. Yeah, but fully understand the, the, the kind of frustration and when life matters. Actually, you have a very important... Yes, please. Kat. I was going to say, can I comment there as well? Because I think, I think there's, I and mean, I've sort of mentioned it, that so many people want something really simple and actually mm -hmm. it's really complex and it can transmit through small aerosols and probably larger aerosols and probably occasionally large droplets and possibly occasionally off the surfaces. And to be able to understand all of that and to understand all of the potential mitigations is quite challenging. And I mean, I've seen this all the way through that people tend to get stuck on one thing and follow that one thing. Mm -hmm. And you have to try and remember, remind them, actually, no, you mustn't forget the other things while you're now doing that one thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's human nature, but it is really challenging to get that across in the right way. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be, find ways of, under, of explaining that complexity better to people. And it's Actually, not just that. People, the, people I, forget. People forget. So I'm giving the same interview as I did a year ago about masks. Yeah. How do masks work? Why do they work? What's the evidence for the mask working? And it's like, I talked about this a year ago, and the evidence has just got better and better. And the people are still saying, well, they don't work. Yeah. I, I think I was, not I was, the same people, but some of it's different people who weren't listening before. But you know, I was challenged by a surgeon who refuses to wear a mask in, in surgery on radio. Uh, in fact, I actually refused to, to go on the, on the program saying that masks don't work. And I said, I don't want to get involved with that argument. It's clear that masks work now. It's no point just for your for your viewing figures, your listening figures. Yeah. I wish actually this conversation continue. And in particular, one participant is also about the conceptual issues, aerosols, particle, whatever. But I, I, I like to skip it because there are many, many a number of important questions. So Julian Kef, you dismissed reaerosolization of infectious particles, droplets desiccation from formite when redispersed. Studies with radioactive particles have been shown to do this. Has there been any studies on infectious, uh, infectious particles? I think the, the participants ask about uh, your views on, um, I mean, this, this aerosolized formite or re aerosolization of uh, deposited particles involvement in the transmission. So, so well, I wouldn't say we dismissed it. I think we didn't mention it. Um, <laughs> I think, um, yeah, it's not something we've looked at a huge amount. I think there's definitely some evidence for some other diseases that you can get reaerosolization and transmission. Um, I do think with this one, it might be the case that if it happens, it's got to happen quite quickly. So reaerosolization off the surface 12 hours later is probably no risk because I don't think the I don't think the virus is likely to be viable for that long. Uh, I might be wrong, but um, so I think if it does happen, it would be something that might happen quickly, possibly off PPE or something like that. But it's I, I think there is a gap in that that information at the moment. Yeah, so my view is that it doesn't happen very often. I mean, if you look at the masks, the way the masks work, they trap capture these particles. They don't reaerosolize from masks, and I think that's that's a fallacy. From surfaces, I think also it's relatively rare. We looked into this actually some time ago with Peter Wilson and Ian Eames from UCL. And the, the physics of re is quite tricky. It's quite complicated, but you know, the boundary layer trapping of those particles plus the viscosity and if you like the stickiness of those saliva mucus droplets that land on the floor 
will keep the virus trapped for some time until probably like Cas says they, they actually inactivate uh, probably one to two days later. So I think that risk is much lower with viruses than for example with MRSA. The MRSA we know can be transported and reabilized on the skin scales, etc. It's a totally different kind of uh, organism. Yeah, uh, very important topic. They, uh, there is another question to both of you. So ventilation for infection control has emerged as some sort of key criterion in this pandemic. So no one has a precise number. It's probably challenging to come up with one number anyway. It's more likely all about reducing exposure and mitigating risk. Does this mean as we get newly mutated variants with increased transmissivity and the ventilation rate will become different. It's so kind and <laughs> modest, actually will be higher. You know, how do we wave in this into designing a ventilation system in buildings? Questions to both of you. You want me to go first? I keep uh, yes, Kat, uh, thank you. Let's talk, uh, let's talk about that. I think, it, it, so I guess one of the things with ventilation is there is a law of diminishing returns. So you if you want to halve the risk you double the ventilation rate and so uh, uh, the higher you know going from one one air change an hour to two air changes an hour gives halves your risk but then you've got to go to four and then you've got to go to eight to keep going with that halving so i think the the benefits in going to very high ventilation rates start to become less and start to become less practical and we do have to think about the climate somewhere in here too um the, also we do have we have guidance for many buildings. So most buildings, it's around 10 litres per second per person. We've got guidance for healthcare, which is typically around six air changes an hour in uh, patient rooms. Um, huge numbers of buildings don't achieve that. So to me, it makes a lot more sense to let's try and achieve what was already set out before we start changing the numbers again. Because, <laughs> you know, if you move the goalposts and nobody's even achieved the first one, it becomes even harder. I think the other point is that with new, more transmissible variants, it's quite hard to know exactly why it's more transmissible. So sometimes it might be, it does look like with the Delta variant, it was a higher viral emission rate, possibly a lower infectious dose, but difficult to say. With Omicron, I don't think we know yet. I think there's, I think it may be the same again, but I think it looks also like the incubation period is shorter. So you get a more rapid generation rate in cases, which then is not quite the same as um, the, the, transmissibility, the, the, in, the transmissibility in terms of viral particles in the air. Yeah, okay, there's some terms that, Kath, you're not using properly as a virologist. <laughs> Go on, you can So basically what, it, what, what the, the data from the year seems to be showing is that the doubling time of the virus is shorter. So it goes from like five to 10 to 20 uh, over two, four, six days, rather than what it used to be over like seven, 14, 21 days. There are a couple of reasons for that. From a virus point of view, the, the eclipse phase, the replication within a cell uh, is shortened from say, you know, perhaps two days to one day, okay? And then it's the time from that to when the virus emerges to shedding the virus okay that still may not be the incubation period that is actually a kind of uh, infectious period and you may not get any symptoms till later on which could be one or two days later because the symptoms come from the immune response okay so what you've got you've got a shorter eclipse phase it replicates in, within the cell faster to a certain viral load that may then be exhaled earlier even before symptoms start but then also if you're causing less severe illness the people who are infected are wandering around, not staying at home, lying in bed, like, like they did with smallpox, for example. So you've got not only the shorter eclipse phase, but also more people who are asymptomatic or mildly infected, wandering around, spreading more virus to other people. So you have more index cases within which those viruses are replicating at a higher uh, rate, if you like, to cause that infectious period to occur earlier. So they can spread to more people earlier, even before they've got symptoms. I think from the from the ventilation point of view, I think, you know, Kath's right, if you don't, can't even achieve the basic six air changes per hour, then you can't really compensate for a variant dependent ventilation rate okay so you're not even anywhere near that uh, and so if you have uh, four six or eight air changes per hour versus zero you're already better off so again it's, it's incremental improvement above and beyond what you've got already just like the Singapore Hong Kong hospitals versus the UK hospitals with the early question 
Uh, but an absolute figure, I think, is really impossible to pin down. And that's what the media always wants. What ACH do I need to combat Omicron? What ACH do I need to combat Delta, et cetera? And that's a misconception that is really across the whole media and, and even the politicians. And it's very hard to break that because people don't get this. They don't like this uncertainty. Yeah, that's a very good uh, comments. But uh, my boss gave me 10 more minutes maximum. He's already few minutes past. Um, uh, the, the, the participant who asked this question about, uh, uh, you know, precaution principle has a response. I like to repeat that. So he said, my response. Yes, there are all kinds of practical barriers to using precautionary principle, but those country practical constraints tends to become permanent barriers to improve <laughs> future response. This is not a question to you, just a reply. So, import, uh, there are I mean, quite a few questions. I'm sorry, I have to skip some, right? So, have there been any, has there been any progress related to those response? For example, identifying levels of susceptibility, immune response indicators, genetic markers, so on? You I think that's a very, right? well, I think that's a very difficult question from a virus point yeah, of view, possibly. because the virus, the virus enters you and everybody has a different innate initial immune response pending that specific antibody T cell response later on. And that innate immune response we know in children can actually clear a lot of the virus very early, uh, in the elderly not so much so. So that kind of dose response I think is really a kind of Cinderella question. It's very, you can't really answer it and make it apply in a more general form beyond like you know maybe half a dozen people. So I think this dose response thing is something you can use in a model very easily, like we did with Cara, for example, and, and I'm sure Kath has done with her models and that viral load question as well. But that can vary so much across the population based on their baseline immunology. I don't think a fixed number or a fixed um, equation or correlation is going to be very helpful. And again, a lot of the interventions that we do in medicine are very crude. Okay, so what's on your hands? How much virus is on your hand? It doesn't matter, you wash your hands, they go away. How much virus is coming towards you? Don't know, just wear a mask, it reduce whatever is coming towards you. Well, turn on the ventilations, reduce what's coming towards you. So that kind of fine detail of the dose response uh, curve, if you like, really doesn't have a, a, a proportionate response in terms of the fine ventilation you can adjust for, or the fine masking you can adjust for, or the fine hand washing you can adjust for. Oh, I wash my hands just three times a day because the viral load is lower, five times a day for Omicron because the viral load is higher, et cetera. It, it, I don't think it works very well in that, in that way. I would agree. I mean, there is that, there's that, I mean, you've got a dose response curve that would reflect what happens for diff, a range of different people in a population. Uh, I think it's useful to know roughly where that curve sits. Um, you know, are we talking, you know, 10 or a thousand, but it's not, it, it, it's, it does, it isn't going to substantially change what we do in practice in our response. So it's helpful for modeling. Um, there is, tiny bits of information out there now um so uh, there's there's a little bit of information from the human challenge studies that happened in the uk where um you know and, and it's you know it's a nasal inoculation it's only one bit of it but it is interesting that nearly all of them responded very very similarly there to um and it was about a 50 percent attack rate from i think it's 10 pfu but you know it, it is it's hard to say and hard to say what that might look like if it was an aerosol inoculation. Yeah, I have to skip a many uh, good questions about the uh, Australian, uh, you know, outbreak, uh, the singer, and also ventilation rate, uh, because related to one of the, one of the replies from Julian about uh, the first question. So uh, this is about given the currently occupants have no idea of airborne transmission risk that may or may not be present in the indoor setting. Is this reasonable to suggest that the monitoring and public display of CO2 and PM 2.5 might be, might, might be used for information for occupants just as we do with a, a local thermostat? So do you think we should display or monitor CO2 and PM 2.5 in the room? So, so, so my, my response is a bit like Cass, that if you have a ballpark figure of what's going on in that room, it's helpful. So, you know, if you know the temperature is like 18 or 20, for example, it doesn't really matter if you feel comfortable 
Okay, so it's really, um, but with the CO2, you need to actually measure it. So you need to have something to measure that CO2, which is then a surrogate marker for ventilation rate. And then what do you do with that? Okay, can you just open the windows or you bring in some HEPA portable air filters, etc. So I think you can monitor something as long as you have a response to it. Just like if you do um, screening for cervical cancer, you, it's only worth doing that if you can actually treat the cervical cancer if it appears early. So I think that kind of, uh, if you like, dose response essentially, what's the dose of CO2 and the response to that limited ventilation needs to be proportionate, affordable, and uh, timely if possible. Because there's no point in monitoring it and then you said, you know, upgrade the ventilation next year. Okay, unless you can open the windows or bring in some possible HEPA filter uh, air cleaners, for example. So I think it really depends on what your response could be, whether you actually monitor it or not. I, I, I agree. I think you can. <clears throat> and I think where, how and how you monitor it. So some settings, school classrooms, I think, are a space where you can measure it, monitor it, and you can respond. You can open windows in response. It's not perfect. And we have to be careful not to treat CO2 values as a sort of risk thresholds because they're not they're an indication of ventilation they're an indication of occupancy an indication of activity they don't suddenly say it's safe or unsafe so it, it is an indicator and that has to be done really quite carefully um i think pm is you know it indicates the 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 air quality in the room i think we have to be a little bit careful that you know PM does not are definitely not a measure of virus in the air because the you know the amount of virus that's <laughs> particulate matter that came out of a human compared to the background particulate matter is tiny. Obviously, if you've got low PM, you've got low everything, so it can help. Um, but I think we just yeah, and and I think you know in terms of public displays, you again you have to think what will people do in response. So there's a handful of people in this meeting and probably on my social media who know what to do and they won't go in a place if it's got a high CO2 value. There's the vast majority of the public, public do not know what that means and would ignore it. Um, and you also have to be careful that, you know, low value doesn't necessarily mean it's safe. A low value might mean there's nobody in there. Um, so just because something's showing, showing great ventilation does, does not mean that there's nobody in the room. Yeah, you know, people ask me, what is a safe level of CO2? I said, well, it depends on the situation. You know, if, if, if there's 100 people in there, a safe level might be 1,000 parts per, per million. If you've got one person, then maybe, you know, 800 is not. It depends what they're doing. I mean, they've asked about gyms as well as schools and what's a safe level of CO2 in a school versus a gym is quite different. It's, it's... Yeah, my Ashley friend, Larry, just mentioned that the CO2 meaningful at steady state and false negative if CO2 measured on entering a room. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Kath, I have to ask this one because someone uh, asked about the human challenge study. Now I cannot come up from my head this challenge, human challenge study on the ID50. Is that 10 or is there a paper about? Uh... There isn't a paper yet. There's been, there's been a presentation, which I think is publicly available, and then there'll be a paper. I don't, I, but it's, it's not my study, so, but hopefully there'll be a paper fairly soon from it. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, I have my uh, instruction from my boss who is there and uh, has been one of the most fascinating uh, multidisciplinary uh, uh, seminars I have ever been. And I wish I could join the discussion. And, and uh, actually, I also I cannot have opportunity to ask my own question. Uh, <laughs> um, I really enjoy totally. So I leave the floor to uh, President Pavel Wagowski. Easy, oh, thank I you very much. You know, I, I am not pushing you to finish, but of course, we agreed on one hour uh, presentations uh, on this webinar. And uh, Julian and Kath already contributed 50 minutes more, and I, we know how busy they are. And it was a wonderful discussion. I think we should schedule for more discussions of that. And I know that there are several questions coming in still but we are not able to address all of them for which we apologize because we need to also take, remember that these are very busy people and yeah. so and thank you for all your fantastic patients. contributions, uh, Kath and Julian. Uh, we really got, uh, probably at least I uh, got a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, better understanding of right. all the uh, problems and thanks Julian, especially for, you know, giving it uh, a view from, you know, your, your discipline. This is, was really a very, very useful. And of course, Kat, 
discussing the um, simulation and modeling issues and also the issue about the ventilation, right? So thanks again, and thanks to all the participants. We are still having 67 participants and uh, we will be closing down uh, and informing that the next webinar will be coming soon and the information will be posted on the uh, ECAC uh, web page. And also we would like to apologize for those who could not join our webinar. And so they cannot hear it now, but they will hear it when they will uh, listen to the recorded version, which they can access at uh, our website. We once again apologize for uh, having a limit of number of participants. We don't know what happened. Uh, we applied for a higher number, but uh, suddenly a cap was put uh, just before our meeting. So only 100 participants could join, but all uh, we are in the Christmas mood. And also we would like to you know, somehow uh make make sure that the information that was presented here will be you know all that want, wanted to see it can join and listen to that so this webinar will be put on website on the website of ECAC for free for another one month so those who are still with us and have friends and colleagues who could not join please let them know this information will be posted so during the Christmas time, when you take a break, you can listen to the discussions of uh, Julian and Kath and their fun, fantastic presentation. So once again, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we will be closing down with also wishes of the uh, uh, happy holidays and uh, Merry Christmas to everyone and very prosperous COVID free 2022, hopefully. Thank you very much and see you next time in 2022.